from a spark to an inferno. Under the right conditions, fires can explode beyond our control in a matter of seconds. You just can't do nothing. You just can't stop it. Recent wildfires have become so extreme, they're creating their own weather systems. We're looking at an epidemic of bad fires around the world. Choking smog. Villages razed to the ground. Even fire tornadoes. Holy shit. The 2003 fires that hit Canberra are now the most scientifically important bushfires ever. And tragedies of our own making. In the Rhode Island case, a lot of lessons were learned. It's pretty much the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. What fueled the world's biggest firestorms? Who was to blame? And how did they grow so catastrophic so quickly? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? As the sun rose on the searingly hot morning of February 7th, 2009, Australian fire crews woke to a feeling of dread. No stranger to big and destructive wildfires, they knew conditions today were far worse than any in living memory. If you knew anything about fire, you knew that something horrendous was going to happen. The lead up to Black Saturday was a very, very prolonged, intense drought. So the landscape was being primed, it was crackling. And then we get a particular synoptic setup where basically you transport the hot, dry, arid air masses at speed down into the temperate part of Australia. Victoria, Australia's southeast state, had been baking in an exceptional heat wave. On the day of Australia's deadliest fires, the mercury rocketed past 46 degrees Celsius with winds gusting at 70 kilometers an hour. People were saying that this was going to be one of the worst fire days in memory. Black Saturday had arrived. Because it was so hot, the atmosphere actually looked like what you might expect over the desert. The heat from the surface was mixed through about five kilometers above the ground, which is quite unusual. And if you've got ignitions, in already a primed landscape, you can imagine how those fires are going to burn. If the temperature goes up a little bit, the fuel dries out very fast, and they're the fuels that carry a fire along the landscape. Several fires were already ablaze by the morning. Then just before midday, high winds triggered a power line failure, setting grasslands alight in Kilmore East. You just can't do nothing. You just can't stop it. Within minutes, the fire was uncontainable. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. 
watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. Earth is the only planet that burns because it contains the three ingredients essential to fire. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. Otherwise known as the fire triangle. It's carbon-based life that provides the ample fuel and produces oxygen in just the right amount. If there were any less oxygen, we wouldn't be able to sustain a combustion reaction. And if there were much more, then the fire would burn uncontrollably. Life provides both the fuel in the form of carbon and the oxygen fire needs to thrive. Fire is a extraordinarily complicated process because you have to sink energy into a system to start creating more energy and then you can create a feedback. As the fuel is heated, it will start to break down chemically. Hydrocarbons split and combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water vapor. The process releases heat which becomes the driving force of more fire. The molecules break down and they release gases which are flammable. And it's mostly those flammable gases that carry the fire. And those odd gases that are being emitted suddenly start burning. Of the three ingredients in the fire triangle, fuel is the one we are best able to control before a fire begins. Understanding how different materials combust and drive the spread of flames, it's critical to saving lives, particularly when it comes to fires that begin in the home. In 2017, the world watched in horror as London's Grenfell Tower burned through the night full of desperate residents waiting to be rescued. People was crying, yeah, people yeah, died, yeah, people yeah. screaming. From the way the 24-story building burned like a torch, many fire experts immediately suspected a highly flammable exterior. It was moving extremely fast in an upward direction. And I was thinking to myself at that point, this has got to be, it has to have that cladding on it. As you got to the top, like, you could see uh, children uh, screaming at the top as well. We have seen a number of fires with combustible exterior cladding. And for one reason or another, whether it's in China, such as at the China Central Broadcasting, or in the Middle East at the building known as the Torch, in a tall building, there's really no way to stop it. The fire began just before midnight with faulty electrics on a hot point fridge on the fourth floor. Within half an hour, it was out of control. The fire broke through the window and proceeded to ignite the exterior cladding system, which served to accelerate the fire growth. The cladding was made of sheets of aluminium containing a polyethylene insulation material which provided a vertical racetrack for the flames. They're made of the same hydrocarbon-based materials that you find in gasoline. That's functionally what, what they are. Many residents, tragically advised by the fire department to stay in their apartments and wait for help to arrive, lost their early chance of making it out alive. In some countries, that is a standard firefighting procedure and it's intended to facilitate fire department operations. I don't know why the fire brigade didn't break the glass to, to, to tell the people to go out. I haven't heard no alarm. I only heard in my house smoke alarm. 
The lack of multiple fire exits had been a source of complaints even before the Grenfell Inferno. There was only one staircase, which allowed both the firefighters to make access, but it also was used for egress from the victims. So there was chaos in the single staircase. The fire stairs was on this side where it was already burning, so they couldn't get down. If you've ever been in a tall building and tried to exit down the stairs, it's much more difficult than you think, especially when everyone else in the building is trying to exit at the same time. Combine that with smoky conditions and spread to the outside so they couldn't safely enter the building and control the fire. The amount of heat produced by that is not to be underestimated. You can't even get near the building at some point. Although 100 firefighters managed to get inside the building, they simply couldn't reach the people trapped on higher floors. People were jumping off buildings, people were screaming, help me, help me, help me. By the time the fire had burned itself out, 71 people had perished. The deaths generally will be caused first by smoke. General statistics from the National Fire Protection Association suggest that more than 75% of fire deaths are related to smoke inhalation. The smoke travels ahead of the fire and is very deadly, so you don't need to actually be exposed to the direct heat of the fire to succumb. The carbon monoxide basically take the place of where oxygen should be in your red blood cells, so it starves your, your brain, your muscles of oxygen. You effectively suffocate. Products that are petroleum-based or foam-based are gonna put off a, a higher level of smoke than, say, for instance, a burning piece of wood. Aside from a single fire exit and highly flammable exterior, there was another fatal flaw in fire safety management that undoubtedly cost many lives. A lack of sprinklers. To my knowledge and my experience in the fire protection industry, there's never been a fatality in a sprinkler building. I am an advocate that these buildings need to be retrofitted to protect the occupants, no matter what the cost, because you cannot buy a life. I think that there's a high probability that there would be very few, if any, fatalities if the building had been sprinklered. Fire is not always a destructive force. Our planet has evolved alongside it, and fires sweeping through the landscape in the right balance can be a powerful driver of renewal. Fires are very traumatic, but they're also that amazing sunrise of all of this life suddenly coming up after the catastrophe. Smoke can be a cue for germination and for flowering. You have ash beds, which is very nutrient rich. There's light, they've removed pathogens in the soil. It's perfect for rapid growth. Australia has always known big bushfires. Its dominant tree, the eucalypt, can't live without it. But their leaves are full of flammable oils. And once fires reach the canopy, a small ground fire can explode into a terrifying, all-consuming firestorm in a matter of minutes. There's another house going up the back. This is what happened on Black Saturday. The Kilmore East fire began as a low energy grass fire, racing across paddocks in the strong, gusty winds. When it hit pine and eucalypt forests, its behavior became extreme. It's so unpredictable. It's been blowing this way one minute and then it's been going that way the next. Winds were already estimated at 100 kilometers an hour, and the fire was beginning to create its own self-sustaining weather. 
So as the fire burns fuel, it releases heat and water vapor into the atmosphere, which make it warmer than the air around it. And that air rises, and as it does, it pulls in other air at the base. Sometimes these winds created by the fire are the dominant force spreading the fire. On the ground, fire crews struggled to breathe, describing the fires as sucking the oxygen out of the air. The wind's getting up, and uh, you can see it's tightening the tree behind you. And then, of course, there's a really horrifying extra dimension. The fires eject fires ahead of them, spotted, as it's called. You could imagine how terrifying that must be that you're in a safe place and suddenly there may be a fire burning in front of you because the fire has literally leapt kilometres. Spot fires were being created as far as 40 kilometres ahead of the fire front. In some cases, turning into major fires themselves. You couldn't fight it. I mean, you know, that's, that's some, you, you just couldn't do that. Firefighting aircraft were deployed, but there was a limit to how much they could achieve. The problem with aerial firefighting is an expectation in the society that whenever there's a fire, there will be a bomber. But under certain circumstances, these aerial firefighting techniques just can't work. The fires are too intense. The intensity of large forest fires means that prevention is often the only way to manage them. There's two concepts that people get confused about involving the active use of fire to manage fires. And there's the preemptive or elective use of fire. That's often called planned burning or prescribed burning. And that's a way of reducing fuel loads. Prescribed burning is done on specially chosen days, during the cooler months of the year, when fire is less likely to escape control. Back burning, on the other hand, is an emergency procedure. Right now, the purpose of this operation is to try to hold the fire. Firefighters will choose to light a fire, and they're burning back into the head fire. Hey Cody, when you come down, watch out for the barbed wire right here. And basically what they're doing is that they're trying to starve the fire of the fuel it needs. Again, it's a very dangerous procedure. If it goes wrong, you could actually make a fire bigger or worse, but it's a very important technique Aerial firefighting is equally risky and much more expensive. Aerial firefighting, certainly to put out small fires, incredibly important, but it's not a cure. Before you know it, we're wanting to spend more and more of the budget with these aircraft, sucking up all of the resources for the preventative measures that could reduce the risk to communities and reduce fuel loads and fire hazard in the landscape. Ironically, one of the main factors contributing to a recent string of devastating fires in the US is their century of fire suppression policy. This ideology has turned forests into a dense and verdant fire trap. Add increasingly warm conditions to the mix, and fires are reaching record intensities and sizes. It's brought a new term into the scientific literature. Megafire. California's most destructive wildfires in history began on a Sunday night. They swept through Santa Rosa at speed with little warning. Many were asleep. There was no time to save anything. We didn't have time to think about what to grab. We grabbed what we saw. The next day, residents stumbled through the smoking ruins of their city in shock. Oh my God. Our 
Home right there. Gone. It looks like a bomb went off. The total incineration of some areas left forensic teams without even DNA to work with. My mother calls me. She says, I can't, I can't get out. There's fire everywhere. She tells me she's going to die. She can't get out of her house. In some cases, the serial numbers of artificial joints and implants were the only clues to who had perished. Aluminium hubcaps melted into the gutters. Many months after, investigators still weren't sure what sparked the main tub's fire on the 8th of October, 2017. There'd been a very protracted drought in California. Then there'd been uh, a very wet spring, which meant that there was a tremendous amount of spring growth. Then, surprisingly, the summer was very, very hot and dry, so that fine fuel dried out. At the end of the fire season, the rains never materialised. Most people at that point would have thought the fire season was really throttled right back. With autumn came the dreaded Diablo winds. Hot, dry winds blowing in from the interior of the continent. Diablo winds are associated with air masses being pushed over mountains under really high pressures, which has been dried out as it passes over a mountain and then pushes down the slope and comes down at tremendous force. Weather conditions were lining up and the landscape was primed for a burning. A spark was all that was needed. Reports were made of power lines breaking and transformers exploding, and it's suspected that those might have been the ignition of the fires. The main blaze erupted at 9.43 p.m. Fanned by gusting winds of over 140 kilometers an hour. Fires normally like to burn upslope, but these winds are so strong and the flames are being bent down over and catching the fuel in front of them and they're just rushing down. It was very unusual in terms of how fast it spread. It spread more than 12 miles in a little over three hours. Where are my wife and kids? As the fire roared towards the city of Santa Rosa, emergency services raced to evacuate tens of thousands of residents. More than 3,000 buildings burned down that night, despite many fire crews on the ground. When a fire has very tall flame lengths and is spreading really fast, often there's very little they can do. The priority in those situations are to save lives. Oh, she's disabled. All right, all right, let me get her feet. Let me get her feet. Her husband's right behind you. Sheriff, one stand for we're doing a carry out. You ready? Fighting fires at night is so much harder than fighting a fire in the daytime in terms of just organising evacuations. It's just another level of complexity. After it swept through Santa Rosa, the fires jumped Highway 101, ramping up to speeds of 100 kilometres an hour. Fire was spotting well ahead of itself. Exploding across Northern California's wine country, it burned an acre a minute. So then suddenly you had a firestorm burning into agricultural landscapes, vineyards, and settlements where most people had disconnected from the risk of fire disasters. Oh man, this is you right here? I'm trying to salvage what's going to be up in flames here, it's like pretty soon. You know, the probability of that happening, you're getting a really bad jackpot there. By Wednesday 10th, more towns were in jeopardy. All 5,000 residents of Calistoga were asked to leave that night, as well as smaller communities of Geyserville and Boys Hot Springs in Sonoma. Exhausted fire crews tried to backburn to slow the fires. They are doing a backfire along the road, creating a, a larger buffer along this roadway. 
more than 11,000 firefighters battled several blazes across hundreds of thousands of acres in the Northern California wildfires. Extra crews were flown in from Canada and Australia, some working 80 hours straight to save lives and homes. By the time the fires were contained, the toll was staggering. 43 people lost their lives, many in their homes or right near them. More than 8,000 buildings burnt down and losses totaled a billion dollars. And we're back here today for the first time. And as you can see, devastation, there's nothing left. So. As horrendous as the Australian Black Saturday fires were in their first few hours, they were about to get much, much worse. A cool change was coming. A cool change should bring relief, and ultimately it does. But the fact that the cool change does have this dramatic impact on the fire direction of travel can make it quite dangerous. The most ferocious part of a fire is the head fire. As the dry, hot winds drove the fire front onwards, long, skinny flank fires were left in their wake. The respite, if there wasn't a fire, is the cool change. But the respite is actually when the bad things happen. At 5.30 p.m., the wind swung around. From a hot desert northwesterly, to a cool southwesterly, blowing in from the ocean. Instead of welcome relief, it brought catastrophe. So if you've got a fire which has been burning under a certain wind direction, if that wind changes, say, 90 degrees, then the long flanks of the fire can turn into a head fire. The flank fires morphed into gigantic head fires. Oh, pretty bad, isn't it? A lot of people can be caught unawares because they're thinking the fire is burning over there that way, where suddenly it's coming straight at you. The fire at the edge of King Lake changed direction and consumed the town. Couldn't get out of town, so we just went down to the roundabout down there and watched the town burn. And it was just like that, all gone. With the fire front stretching for kilometers, roads became impassable. Trapped, residents had no way out. The most tragic thing is that the decision to go was left too late, and then people were killed trying to flee. We lost our home, I lost my car and everything on my back. In the final count, the Black Saturday fires claimed 173 lives. The outcome was so horrendous, it led to a new fire danger rating. Catastrophic. The Black Saturday fire was right outside the range of historical variability. I mean, this was stretching the imagination of seasoned firefighters. Fire could be doing absolutely nothing. Within half an hour, it could be, you know, off and running again. In the post-fire assessment, it was said the total energy released by the wildfires was equivalent to 1,500 of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima. The consequences of all that energy being released in a short period of time can have dramatic effects on atmospheric conditions, creating a literal firestorm. These are really generating tremendous energy and they're ejecting into the atmosphere matter and heat and water vapour. These are what we scientifically call a coupling between the fire and the atmosphere. A cumulonimbus without fire is terrifying enough. A massive thundercloud capable of creating severe weather, like tornadoes. Oh my God! Large fires can provide all the ingredients a cumulonimbus needs to form. Massive, heated updrafts of moisture and instability in the atmosphere 
as fire risk increases across the world and we see a greater frequency of large, intense fires. The pyrocumulonimbus, or pyro-CB phenomenon, is becoming a hot scientific topic. Well, the reports of a thunderstorm in the uh, smoke plume, that's automatically into uh, unusual territory in fires. In Australia, we've worked out now we've entered an era of these fire thunderstorms. From the start of satellite monitoring in 1978 until 2001, in Australia we had two known and two possible pyro CB events. Since 2001, we've confirmed another 56. In 2003, a wildfire near Australia's capital city, Canberra, spawned one of the most famous pyro CB events in history. It gave birth to the first scientifically documented fire tornado. Just like the Black Saturday bushfires, a huge area was alight just before the cloud formed. We had a dry lightning storm move over the Australian Alps and it lit lots and lots of fires. A lot of them defied initial suppression actions and they kept brewing across the landscape. The fires tore through the national park surrounding Australia's bush capital. And by the morning of January 18th, 70% of the dense forests were ablaze. All the fires in our area had merged, and that settled in at about 275,000 hectares. Notify any unit that's in the forestry settlement to evacuate immediately. By 9 a.m., residents were battling spot fires, and emergency services were hastily retreating into the suburbs. What could have caused a fire to consume so much forest in less than 10 days? We had observers flying around, and they were the first to see things that were truly weird going on. Scans showed the answer lay in a previously unknown interaction between fire and the rugged terrain. Normally, if you get a fire starting at a point, it will head in the direction of the wind, forming a, you know, roughly a, a long sort of oval shape. Well, these scans showed fire spreading almost perpendicular to the way the wind should have been pushing it. So a sort of a right angled kink in the back of the fire line. It stood out because there was nothing really in the literature which said that fire should spread in a direction 90 degrees to the way the wind's trying to push it. The fires that just all around us can be completely surrounded by fire at the moment. It's just scary stuff. In each instance, the fire spread laterally along the lee facing slopes, those protected from the wind, which are usually considered the safest side from a fire. This fire behavior was named vorticity driven lateral fire spread. As the wind drives the inferno up the slope, it separates from the hill at the crest, barreling over itself to create a horizontal eddy. The eddy simultaneously halts and stokes the flames at the ridgeline, forcing it to spread laterally. So you sort of have the fire spreading across, but at the same time spreading embers downwind, which then light up large tracts of land. We're talking about leaves and branches and all sorts of stuff being just sucked up into the atmosphere and then blasted forward, raining down sparks into the bush. So you've got this horrifying capacity of these fires to literally explode across landscapes. By 3 p.m., an eerie twilight of smoke and flame had descended on Canberra, and the first houses ignited in the suburbs. Smoke occurs when combustion is incomplete. This can be caused because the ignition temperatures are not hot enough and result in smoldering, or because of the presence of materials other than carbon in the fuel source. Wood, for example, is not made of pure carbon, but contains a mix of carbon, volatiles, water, and minerals. In the absolute purest form, the smoke that would be coming out of a perfect fire would actually be invisible. It would just be CO2. 
the smoke we see is often some of the gases which are coming off and then they can condense into little globules and they are actually quite toxic. In confined spaces, toxic smoke can kill in minutes. Barely a month after the Canberra bushfires, the station nightclub fire in Rhode Island would take the lives of 100 people. As the band Great White started their first set, pyrotechnics were set off on either side of the stage. It happened to be pointed directly at this polyurethane foam sound insulation. Within seconds, the highly flammable foam was alight. It was a petroleum-based product, and it was easily ignitable, and the fire spread quickly through this material because of its lack of fire retardant product built into the foam. Within 36 seconds, you had your first calls to 911. By the time the fire services had arrived, five minutes into the blaze, the building was engulfed in flames. People are running out on fire. It's pretty much, pretty, probably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. The last survivor made it out the main exit just five minutes and 30 seconds after the fire started. My sister and I were at the front of the stage and as soon as I saw it going up, the foam padding, I grabbed her and, and we went right out the back. The investigation of the station nightclub fire disaster involved many local, state, and federal agencies. The fire scene was processed in the days after, involving a forensic archaeologist and representatives of NIST. Subsequent to that disaster, the National Institute of Standards and Technology conducted a number of studies. When it actually happens and the fire spreads as quickly as it does, there is a need to be able to revisit that fire and that building to see what happened. At no time did my brother or I have any knowledge that pyrotechnics were going to be used by the band Great White. There were a number of requirements that they had contravened. First and foremost, the use of pyrotechnics. No permission was ever requested by the band or any of its agents to use pyrotechnics at the station, and no permission was ever given. In combination with an untreated, non-fire retardant polyurethane foam, that was the fundamental flaw. Fire retardant foam was double the price, an extra $6 for every person who perished. To study how the fire progressed, the NIST rebuilt the stage and main room using the same materials. Just as it did on the night, the fire rapidly spreads across the polyurethane foam. A ceiling of black, toxic smoke begins to descend just 50 seconds in. That smoke can be a few hundred degrees. That's similar to if you touch a hot stove, your finger will blister. So as you breathe it in, you effectively sear your lungs. When your lungs blister, uh, effectively you drown in your own bodily fluids. By one minute and 20 seconds after ignition, there is barely any visible space. Anybody inside? The smoke, heat, and fire prevented many occupants from reaching the exit quickly, and many didn't realize there was more than one. The club was above capacity, and interestingly, the station nightclub had four exits. The majority of people, believe it or not, when they go into a building, the only exit they know is the one that they entered into. The main exit was two large double doors, but escape was severely hampered by a much smaller door in the hallway leading to the exit, as well as a ticket booth. When you look at the, what's called the death map, which is where they find the bodies, a significant number of people were literally crammed into the main exit. 
and people will fall and they will start to stack up like cordwood. People cannot move because they're wedged in the exit. There were three other exit doors in the kitchen, the bar, and the stage door, but they were not obvious to patrons. I talked to a man who said he pulled about six people from the window. One door even swung inwards. In the legal battle that followed, the tour manager was given a prison sentence. This court will therefore sentence you to 15 years at the ACI. Although they fought the charges, the nightclub owners were also fined and one sent to jail. I will never forget that night and I will never forget the people that were hurt by it. I am so sorry. Smoke inhalation is the primary cause of death in structural fires. And in large-scale wildfires, it can be just as hazardous. The Russian wildfires in the summer of 2010 were remarkable for their long-lived and extensive peat fires, which were almost impossible to put out. Burning peat is the classic smoldering combustion. So very thick smoke, which can come out of these fires. Extraordinary quantities of smoke. When it's smoldering fires, as often occurs in peat fires, it can release many other different chemicals, such as carbon monoxide, which is bad for human health. Moscow is surrounded by peat fields, boggy ground containing large amounts of decayed vegetation. It's rich in carbon and usually water saturated. But even these had dried out enough to catch fire. Once you get fires going into the ground, they're extremely difficult to control. Literally, you're fighting a fire underground Putting them out requires an enormous volume of water. Often what can happen with these underground smoldering fires is you can put water onto them and it just can evaporate that water off. Russian soldiers and firefighters were pumping over 400 litres a minute into the bogs, but still couldn't quench them. The haze and smoke blanketing Moscow was so thick and dense that face masks were even being worn indoors. Russian fires had actually blanketed Moscow and affected a huge population for a very long time. The toll on human health was extreme, with around 56,000 people dying from the combined effects of the fires, heat wave, and smoke. 62 people died from the fires themselves, only a tiny fraction of the total tally. So there were very strong, settled, high pressure that got stuck there for a while, and it had been quite dry even before then, and it, it got unusually hot there. You see that they fight all the temperature records. Никогда в стране нашей такое не было, и нет опыта, так сказать, ликвидации вот такой вот ситуации в таких условиях. Temperatures were 10 to 12 degrees above normal for a long length of time, and thousands of fires broke out across Russia. All of these events that we're seeing around the world have all got peculiar climatologies, particularly combinations of drought, wind, heat, which in various formats in different environments will be creating uncontrollable and epic fires. 
which we're seeing increasingly all around the world. The epic fires in Australia's capital city in 2003 were no exception. Leave the area, please. Place evacuation. Please leave the area. Creating ideal conditions for the formation of one of the most dangerous weather phenomena known to man. The fire was affecting, I'd estimate, over 10,000 cubic kilometres of the air. The impacts of these are just incredible. As huge tracts of the landscape were alight, it produced the deep flaming needed for a massive pyrocumulonimbus to form. As the firestorm barreled into the outer suburbs of Canberra, crews were unable to beat back the blaze. We had the damage impacts on the urban edge. There were some houses that were damaged by wind without fire, and the way the debris was removed from these houses, roof tiles and bricks and things five kilometres away from where these houses were destroyed. In a nearby plantation, pine trees had been snapped off at the base in a vortex pattern. So we had the pine plantation flattened in a path that indicated a rotating air mass. This path had the characteristic breaks in the line of wind damage that proved this was a true tornado, rather than the much more common fire worm. The fire tornado, like a true tornado, it was able to lift off the ground in a few places and reattach. Fire whirls cannot lift off and reattach. Fire whirls form when powerful updrafts suck flames into a spiral. But these are attached to the ground, while tornadoes are attached to the base of a rotating thunderstorm forming when horizontal funnels of air are pushed up into a vertical position. Holy shit. The evidence suggests that it's at least an F2 on the modified Fujita scale, which is what the Americans use for measuring tornado intensity. Fire crews were completely unprepared for the magnitude of the disaster. Five hundred homes and four lives were lost. It was only in the aftermath that emergency services realized that something extraordinary had happened. Research into the 2003 Canberra fires was the first to scientifically document a fire tornado. As the climate changes, and temperatures across the world continue to break records. Fire behavior is becoming more unpredictable. We haven't seen a major fire disaster yet. We've only seen the prelude to a major fire disaster. I'm convinced there's something building in the background which is going to just leave everybody speechless. Although we can do much to control building fires and save lives, the future we face on the outside is much more uncertain. To say, why can't fire scientists or climate scientists give us a very clear probability statement of what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years? The reason we can't do that is because it is horrifyingly complicated. The worry is that this interactive system, it's replete with feedbacks, and that's going to be really challenging for the biodiversity because by definition they've never experienced anything like that and it's going to be really challenging for disaster management and it's going to be really challenging for our societies. For those unlucky enough to be caught by one of these big fire disasters and lucky enough to have survived, it's a long road to recovery. Like John Wayne used to say, good Lord willing and the river don't rise. We'll be back home again.